Hello everyone and welcome back to Solar System Colonization. This is post-commentary on the missions that were conducted during the live stream on November 8th. This is all in the Realism Overhaul set of mods for Kerbal Space Program, so we're operating on Earth in the real solar system. The mod list is in the video description. For the most part, this live stream was taking care of business that was lingering over from the previous stream, but first of all I wanted to queue up some of the planetary transfers that we plan to do. So I'm going to use Kerbal Alarm Clock and make sure that we know when the timing of all those transfers will be. And as you can see, we have some time before the first possible transfer, which is to Jupiter. Uh, so the first order of business is actually to refuel the ISRU test that we launched in the previous episode. And it still has its shrunken ISRU unit, as you can see there. But it's in orbit around the moon, and we need to basically fill up that tank right there so that it can land on the moon. Remember, for a lunar landing, we're looking for about 2,600 meters per second of delta V. So here's the refueler mission. The first stage is of putting it together, create a general little fuel tank on top, a larger transfer stage on bottom, and then size them with respect to each other to make sure you've got things right. And so it's an RL-10 stage on the bottom that will transfer us, and then we've got two kilonewton thrusters on the fuel tank itself. And uh, it will be launched on top of a Falcon Heavy, but right in the middle here, I encounter a sudden and unexpected issue. There you go. Um, suddenly, the ground intrudes into the VAB at an odd angle. Don't ask me how. You can see outside, the VAB is clearly lying on its side. Which is confusing because we're supposed to be in the VAB. So, yeah, this is, this is very odd. But, um, yeah, I, I actually don't end up restarting just yet, because eventually the problem clears, as you'll see in a moment here. Here, uh, uh, well, it was still tilted outside, but we don't have the ground inside here. And in a moment, it will stop appearing outside as a tilted VAB. But if you guys have ever had this problem, please tell me, because I have no idea. It turns out that uh, continuing was not possible. Uh, there you go. As we tried to send it out to the launch pad, we got this situation, so I had to restart anyway. Uh, yep, probably saw that coming. Yep, yep, that does not look like a safe KSC to launch things from. Actually, I can't do anything right now anyway, it's frozen, but... Uh, and I didn't even do anything special to uh, destroy the planet. Go figure, I mean, you think you'd have to come up with some sort of fancy little contraption or something. Anyway, we eventually restarted and got Falcon Heavy on the launch pad. Now, I do have fuel cross-feeding from the Woosters into the center stack, and uh, we had a, a good discussion about when I should be using that and when I shouldn't. It's only supposed to be for the heaviest loads. Otherwise, uh, it seems like Falcon will uh, throw back the core stage while the Woosters are running. And so there won't be any fuel cross-feeding uh, for the lighter loads. This is a fairly, this is fairly light load for Falcon Heavy. Okay, so off we go. Now, unfortunately, Falcon Heavy produces quite a frame rate and physics hit because of the 27 engines you see running there. Nine on each portion, you know, uh, nine on each of the boosters and nine on the core. And so, yeah, this was much slower in, in real time. And in fact, I've had to max out the amount I can fast forward this for you. And still, we aren't uh, one to one on the seconds in the game versus seconds in real life. Okay, so here you see the boosters uh, running out, uh, but we're getting to a very, very high altitude here before they actually have to drop off. Actually, this is uh, about where the space shuttle SRBs drop off. Pretty much the same place, altitude-wise. Now, we didn't reserve any fuel in the boosters for a mock recovery, so... They, they are not uh, being even imagined to be recovered on this one. And so we can't really see the Delta V for reserving the core stage either, because for some reason with MechJab, when the fairings are on, it doesn't like... Okay, well now we can see, but it's a little bit too late. So yeah, we've run out of fuel on the core stage, and separation and ignition of the second stage, and then fairing separation. Yeah, so uh, you saw I moved up the fairings in order to see the Delta V remaining in the stage. And I don't know why MechJab has that particular problem, but it does. 
So sometimes you have to move the fairings to a different stage in order to see what the Delta V is in the stage that you're on. Okay, well, our payload has its solar panels out, antennae out. Remember, we do have remote tech in here, so gotta make sure communications are okay. This is a uh, um, probe core mission. Alright, so we are in orbit. It is a fairly good orbit. And now we have some fuel left over in the second stage to start out our transfer to the moon, but we'll have to continue to use the transfer stage after that. And here I am plotting my course. Now we do have to rendezvous with the ISRU test, so make sure we have to make sure that we get into the same general sort of situation that it is in. So here we have reignition of the second stage to start us out, and depletion of the second stage right about now and separation I actually had the separation occurring at the same time as the upper stage ignition which is not a good idea because we have to make sure that the propellant is settled but the propellant was settled so everything was good and we continue with the RL-10 onto the moon and here we are close to the end of the burn and we see that we'll have about 1200 meters per second left over after this burn and that's more than enough to get us into orbit around the moon. Orbit around the moon takes about 800 meters per second in a tight orbit and uh, possibly 900 if you want to overestimate a little bit. Uh, I fine-tuned the orbit using RCS getting us close but you can see there's still an inclination discrepancy between us and the target and that is partly because of our interesting approach. We are overshooting a bit and then coming back in. But uh, here we go, and uh, it's not as bad as it initially looked as far as an, our approach. I corrected a little bit. You can see me making a correction here to lift my periapsis, but also to change the inclination as much as possible from far out, but we can't do all of it there. Okay, so here we go. It looks like we have about 16 degrees of inclination to fix, and that's why you see I'm tilted away from retrograde, somewhere between retrograde and the inclination marker. So there we go, and inclination does get fixed. But we still have a lot of work to do as far as rendezvous is concerned. Um, we're quite a bit off, closest approach distance of more than a thousand kilometers. But you see I kept my apoapsis fairly high so that we could phase with the target. And we now dispense with the transfer stage so that we can maneuver a little bit more nimbly. Because the RCS, there was no RCS on the transfer stage. And so it's a little bit cumbersome to turn about. Also, because of the need to fix inclination, we did run out of fuel on the transfer stage, even though we seem to have more than enough for orbit. But uh, we had to fix the inclination as well, so that's why we used the whole 1200 meters per second. Here the two kilonewton thrusters are doing their job of getting us closer to the target. I had to do a number of burns because I was a little bit off on the whole maneuver node creation thing again. Uh, but uh, yeah, slowly getting there. First uh, within 10 kilometers and then within 1 kilometer. Once we reach the target, of course, we have to match velocities with it. And since our apoapsis is high, that took a substantial burn. I didn't show the burn, but you can see the drop in delta V. And then we were finally ready to approach the test unit. And so here we go, aiming for docking with the unit. Now the docking ports are on that uh, SS transfer stage right there. So we have to link up with that. These docking ports are smaller ones. These are propellant only docking ports. They do not allow Kerbals to pass through. Though, frankly, I've had trouble getting Kerbals from one section of the station to another, even with the docking ports that do allow Kerbals to pass through. So, yeah, it's a tricky business in realism overhaul altogether. But here are the tiny little docking ports. There you see the five SS engines that we are using. And those will start off our descent to the moon. They use hydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide. Here we go. And bump. A lot less magnetism in realism overhaul than in stock, so watch out for that if you're trying this sort of docking. There we go, finally got a connection and transferred the fuel, and then separation. This will deorbit itself. So as we separate, we will see that it will use its RCS thrusters to bring the periapsis down to a negative amount, and then it'll be alright. Unfortunately, uh, we'll have to fix that ISRU unit uh, later on. 
Actually, there's a lot we have to fix with the whole test here. Uh, turns out it's a good thing we test these things, because uh, it sure needed it. Because the moon had changed its position relative to the sun, and so we had a different uh, area lit, I had to change my landing plans, so that's what you see there, figuring out where to land now that the sun was lighting a different portion of the moon. And here is the scent burn. Uh, it takes a long time to burn off all of the orbital velocity we have around the moon, especially with uh, relatively weak engines, though not totally weak, just uh, I think the thrust weight ratio about 0.5-ish or something like that initially. But here they're running out of steam. And this is where we get into the dicey part of the business because remember, uh, we're currently using the controller on that stage, but we gotta switch to the controller on the, on the planetary base ink parts, so on the next stage there. And uh, that turns out to be a real trick. Because, remember, this is the controller, uh, I think it's called HAL, well, possibly MAL, uh, it's either HAL or MAL, I forget which one is which. Um, this is the one that caused the rotational issue on SLS initially uh, when we tried to launch the first time. And so, even though it looks balanced right now, you can see it starts listening to one side. And it's not the thrust of the thrusters. I made sure that the center mass was between the two sets of thrusters. And by the way, those are uh, Super Draco equivalents. I changed the configuration to match Super Dracos. So that is the configuration for those engines. But uh, it could be the solar panel issue, because the solar panel is sort of awkwardly placed there. But technically the thrusters would be balanced with regard to the solar panels. I do bring the solar panels in. Uh, that actually, I think, made matters worse rather than better. Uh, yeah, uh, it sure didn't help. Uh, ultimately, I had complete loss of control. I mean, I couldn't use the RCS. There is no reaction wheel on here. Uh, but the RCS wasn't strong enough to try and get this to turn around. There was just no way to point it in the direction I wanted. And so I couldn't even use the thrusters. You can see it's just spinning wildly even when the thrusters are not active. So the RCS is just uh, not control. I think it was the controller that was to blame. So uh, yeah, without the ability to orient properly, um, I oh and there was a fuel imbalance issue. Uh, for some reason, even though everything was symmetrical around the center, uh, the thrusters decided to uh, take fuel from one tank and not the other. And so I tried to rebalance that, but there's not enough time. Whether that was what was causing the orientation issue, I don't know. Possibly. But why there was that issue, I have no idea, because everything was supposed to be symmetric. Go figure. Okay, well, anyway, uh, obviously a lot to do with here. First of all, the ISR unit cannot be the root part, and so I've put another controller on the front of this, and another controller on the top so we can have the different orientation. I test all this out on the, on the, on the runway, as you can see. And so there's a controller on the top there, that's the other one, well, uh, I forget whether it's HAL or MAL. Uh, both really horrible names for controllers. Anyway, here I, as a break I decide to introduce SLS Block 3. I'm not going to have an SLS Block 2. SLS Block 3 has the same payload capacity to orbit as Block 2, but instead of using uh, Perios boosters or the equivalent, it uses 4M1 boosters. And I've placed them the way they are so that they somewhat match the locations of the existing booster hardpoints because the booster hardpoints are sort of on the side there, uh, you know, when the SLS has two boosters. So they'll sort of share that hardpoint. The good thing about them is they're much lighter than the SRBs that are already on the SLS. Because they're burning hydrogen and oxygen on these M1s, all four boosters here weigh the same as a single 5 segment SRB on SLS right now, so that mass savings allows this to carry as much as Block 2 SLS. Uh, so I thought that was a good solution, and we'll just pretend it's Block 2 if you don't think that using M1s is realistic, it's the same payload. Anyway, uh, here I'm trying to make another uh, Kerbal Recovery Capsule uh, to bring Kerbals back down, because I wasn't entirely satisfied with the performance of the Dragon version 2 or the Moon Chaser. Uh, each one seemed a little bit dodgy, quite on the edge, ready to blow up, and so I wanted to see if we could uh, use this capsule, maybe this capsule would be safer. Uh, so I wanted to test like this, 
and you can see it's got a little service module package with a, sing a single S this engine. Uh, one of my favorite engines, obviously. You can see how often I use it. And uh, yeah, just uh, configuring it. Now, uh, people in chat suggested a launch escape system, and I decided to use Super Dracos for that because it's a lot lighter than a launch escape tower. Um, just adding those uh, is a trivial amount of mass, very low impact on Delta V, and uh, a launch escape tower is like 4 tons. So anyway, I configured the Super Dracos to be the abort system, but now I had a problem because uh, anything I tried to put on top of the rocket looked weird. I, I did not like the look of a nose cone like this, or any other nose cone I tried, and so ultimately I created a fake launch tower, a lot lighter than the real launch tower, uh, launch escape tower I mean. And so, uh, yeah, I, I made a little fake launch escape tower just for looks. So there you go. <laughs> anyway, uh, it looked better than a nose cone, what can I say? Alright, so here we are on the launch pad. Uh, we're at night because we're trying to rendezvous with the station. If we weren't trying to rendezvous with the station, we wouldn't need to launch at night, obviously. Okay, so off we go with our test subject. Uh, this is actually a Twitch viewer that I recruited, so uh, we'll hope this Twitch viewer remains safe. So far we haven't lost a uh, Twitch viewer yet. And again, this is launching on a regular Falcon 9, so, that, I mean, I sized it to make sure it could. So, but it's right at the limit, it's right at the limit of the capacity of Falcon 9. And of course, that's why I didn't want to use a 4-ton launch escape system, because there's no way the Falcon 9 could launch it if it was carrying that on top of it. So, anyway, everything looks nominal, and then the first stage runs out. Of course, we run out, uh, we use all the fuel on the first stage, because it's at the limit of the payload capacity of Falcon 9, and so we need all the fuel. So, separation and ignition of second stage. Now I can't uh, have the tower separate because it doesn't have little boosters on it. It can't uh, pull itself away from the rest of the vehicle. So we have to carry the very, very light uh, the pointy thing at the top of this uh, all the way into orbit. So again, we are going to rendezvous with the station first. Uh, we do pick up a Kerbal from the station, so there will be two Kerbals coming back. And uh, well, we'll hope for their safety. Uh, so far so good, but the re-entry is a trick, and that's really what I'm I'm worried about right now. Otherwise we wouldn't even be creating this new system. As good as it looks, it looks it looks pretty decent, but I wouldn't be bothering with a new system if I wasn't worried about re-entry. So here we go, uh, we are going to begin aligning for rendezvous. The station is at 400 kilometers by 400 kilometers, there we separate the launch the fake tower and here we separate off the second stage because now we can use our service module to do all the work and extend our solar panels there we go service module has um, as you can see 1200 meters per second which is a lot but um, not unreasonable for orbital operations that's that's pretty standard during the live stream, there were a lot of comments about the service module. I shaped it in various ways during the construction process, ultimately uh, getting to this sort of shape. And basically, it was what I wanted in order to fit on top of the Falcon 9 properly, that's all. Um, uh, this, Well, it works. It looks okay. Not, not overly impressive, it's sort of stubby, but still. So this is the first burn to match orbits with the station. Uh, we're lifting the apoapsis to about 400 kilometers. And then as we get close to the station, we're at uh, about 8 kilometers right now, uh, we kill relative velocity and uh, nudge ourselves closer. So here again, the service module engine will light. It does have to have its propellant stable. And that's one use of the RCS thrusters. Note that I'm not bothering with the Super Dracos right now, they're only really for a launch escape system. Okay, there we go, there's the station, and we're going to approach. Ultimately, um, I solicit names for the station, and the one I concluded was best was Skynest, and uh, sort of a, a reference to Skynet, that, that suggestion was from Miko, and so, yep. 
we will call it Sky Nest, and then another good suggestion was Da Vinci Station, and we'll use that for the moon. So that is, uh, well that's, we don't really have a naming convention, but at least we have some names to work with. And maybe we'll go in one theme or another. Da Vinci suggests a sort of theme. Anyway, here's docking, and here you'll see a ridiculous lack of magnetism actually. Um, as, as the docking ports touch very convincingly, but their angle is just a little bit off. I don't know if you can see that. Just a little bit off, and so there's no connection made just yet. Eventually it'll concede and work out, but we have to wait a while. Realism overhaul is to a large degree about patience, and here I'm being very patient. Uh, RCS is off, SAS is off, just waiting, waiting, waiting. You can see the, the, the minimal amount of magnetism is finally bringing things together. And... connection. Okay, so everything connected and we transfer our Kerbal to, to the return pod. So now our return pod will have two Kerbals. What's it all? There we go. All shakes out. And... We pull away from the station and, well, hope for the best for these two. So next we move into position for the for the re-entry burn and I think the target this time was the South Pacific. You can see that rendezvous with the station took about 300 meters per second. The re-entry burn tends to take around 100 meters per second up to 200 meters per second. You should always plan for about 200 meters per second. We're assuming low earth orbit here. Um, so that's the kind of reserve I keep. It can cost as little as 60 to 80 if you're already in a fairly low orbit, or uh, if you're in like a shuttle and you don't... Well, the shuttle actually needs more, because it needs lower periapsis. Okay, so off goes the service module, and we need to use the RCS and the pod to pull ourselves away a bit, because that's a little bit too close for comfort. So there I go. The, the pod doesn't have thrusters that can push us forward or back, it uh, has thrusters that can control roll and yaw, so we have to just yaw ourselves away. Okay, and now very early on in re-entry, the heat shield was already indicating that it was very hot and it was glowing, so that was disconcerting. Not a good sign there. Uh, further in, it was still the only part that was really glowing, uh, not using much of its ablator shielding, mind you. The ablator is still largely untouched, but well, it's hot down there. In order to soften the g-forces for re-entry, I toggle descent mode on, which shifts the center of mass a little bit, and you can see that doing its job here. Actually, a lot of times when I toggle descent mode, it doesn't seem to do anything, but here it's very dramatic. Uh, so at least it works for this capsule, but um, g-forces aren't the only problem that we have here, right? We have the heating problem, and it's a matter of balance whether I want the CON to be tilted and things potentially to overheat, because the way it's tilted right now, it puts the docking port and parachute a little bit more at risk. And so I take a look at the temperature situation, I was monitoring the temperature th through all this, and also, you'll note my pitch control is a little bit off. Uh, for some reason, the COM tilt is quite excessive and the RCS thruster was running in order to try and correct that. The pod itself was getting a little bit hot here, as you can see it's got a little tag on there. That got me worried too. So eventually I turn off descent mode. So we go flat on to the airstream. And so this will create a rougher ride for our Kerbals, more G-forces. On the other hand, uh, we don't risk the docking port and parachute as much, which is a good thing, because it turns out that uh, things did want to overheat anyway. You can see here the docking port is very, very quickly heating up, and there it goes. That was real fast. And here you can see the parachute is halfway to overheating, like in an instant. It decides that it wants to overheat, but, but it stops at halfway, which is interesting. Don't know what that's about. Something something seems wrong with the heating situation here. Because either it's gonna get hotter or it's gonna cool off. It's probably not gonna just stay there, I think. But anyway, I was thankful it stayed there because, um, well, we sort of need the parachute. 
And our two Kerbals are relying on that parachute. And I get to arm the parachute, because it survives all that. And actually it deploys earlier than I thought it would. But nothing bad happens as a result. There are actually more parachutes in there than I thought there were. There are those, and then there's another one. Not entirely sure about the real shoots configuration on this one. But uh, here we'll see the parachute pop out. That's another one. That's the one that's configured for the right pressure. I configured it for 0 .3, 0 0.3 atmospheres, and that's about the right height for that. I don't know what... I guess the others were drogue shoots. They're not color-like drogue shoots. And I don't remember configuring any drogue shoots, but there they are. Anyway, um, so still overheated. The whole thing is still over here, but splashes down safely. Unfortunately, for four minutes, I attempt to recover this, and uh, all I can do is get back to Space Center and recover from the tracking station. Uh, the entire re-entry in real time took more than an hour, and so the takeaway from this, this uh, whole endeavor, this live stream, was that maybe I shouldn't recover the Kerbals. Maybe I should just leave them in orbit, because it takes so much of the time bringing them back that it's not worthwhile. It'd be easier to launch supplies up to them and just keep launching supplies up to them, especially since since this is sandbox and we don't have any budget limit. Yeah, so yeah, I reconsider the whole bringing Kerbals back thing. We have some systems that obviously would bring them back successfully if they're in low Kerbin orbit, not low Kerbin orbit, low Earth orbit. Uh, we don't know about bringing them back from Mars directly. That would be trickier. But yeah, that was the takeaway from this episode. Alright, so with that, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this episode, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.